Well, since I messed everything up earlier, let me just go ahead and continue the mess. There are a couple of announcements that need to be made because they're so important in the life of our church. Uh, one, today is the last day to turn in your ballots for the deacon nominations. And so if you've, if you've completed that, you can drop it off. There's a basket out there, or you can put it in one of the boxes. Let me just remind you about how our deacons work and, and maybe the best way to make these recommendations. Our deacons, while they serve on the whole church level, their primary focus is the small groups and our life groups. And so as you think about who should I nominate, think about who are the leaders in your life groups. Who are the, who are the men that, that show servant leadership? And if, if you believe that there is such a man in your small group, which I believe there is in every small group, then my encouragement for you is to recommend them. And then they'll go through a pretty extensive vetting process to see if they feel like God has called them. And at First Baptist Peachtree City, deacons, is, is, it's, it's a place of service. And we stress very highly that God has called them. And so we will take them that process. So that's due today if you would like to make some nominations out of your life group. A second thing is, let me, let me give you a little bit of preview for next Sunday. Next Sunday is the Commitment Sunday of our Unleashed Initiative. If you've been here over the last several weeks, you know that we have, we're addressing um, how we are stewarding our debt. And if, if for those of you who don't know, we, we have a little over $3.2 million of debt still from when we built the bridge and when we renovated here on this property. Uh, I inherited that as pastor, and as, over the last several years, we've been talking about how can we steward this more wisely. And just real quick, uh, we would free up, if we could pay this off three years from now, we'll free up over $300,000 a year that we can turn toward Great Commission Ministry. But over the life of the loan, we'll save the church about $1.2 million. As I shared every week, I would much rather put $1.2 million toward the Great Commission than I would to a bank in interest. Right? And so that's what part of this initiative. The other thing that I want to point out to you is that this is all about the heart. It's about what God wants to do in and through us to impact the world around us. So this, this last week, you should have received a, a, a commitment card in the mail. Next Sunday, we want everybody to bring their commitment cards, and we're going to have a, a, a great time of celebration, but as we come and make our commitments. What's going to happen, just so you have an idea, is there will be three baskets here at the front, and we're going to have everybody, balcony, everybody, to come down uh, and make their commitments. We want you to do two things next week. One is your three-year commitment on the card. Bring it, drop it into one of the baskets. And then we're asking everybody to make a first fruits offering, a, a gift, a, a seed faith offering, whether it's a little bit or a lot, one, a one-time gift to kind of launch us. As a church, I'm, you're going to see me come up next Sunday. I'm going to put my family's commitment. I'm going to put our first offering. But then because God was so good to us this last year and we were faithful in our giving and, and how we use the resources, I'm also going to seed $100,000 from last year's giving to begin the campaign. And so that will happen all next Sunday. When we come down, we're going to have everybody stay on the floor and we're going to pray over uh, the next three years in, in the offering. Got it? I was lame. Got it? All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13. If you go to the beginning of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament. And then if you'll also uh, go over to Joshua chapter 1, that's two books later, I want to share with you what God has laid on my heart regarding Unleashed and where He wants us to go. And today I'm going to be a little more specific. This Honestly, this is a little different message than I, I'm accustomed to, to teaching. Uh, it's more about vision today. It's more about what I believe God wants to do in and through our church, particularly through the bridge. You know, becoming is a beautiful yet sometimes tumultuous experience. I think about my children. I have four children. I remember every one of them when they were born, when they rolled over, when they started toddling, when they started walking, when they started running, when they went from being dependent to moving towards independence. And the whole process is really an amazing thing to watch. At the same time, it's also sometimes pretty scary. 
When they fall, when they bump their heads, when they get scrapes, when they get bruises, when they come up and go, I got a boo-boo right here. And you know, what I've noticed, and I don't know if you've noticed this in your life, but when those things happened and when they were little children, it was like the end of the world. But what I've noticed is the, the older you get, the bumps, the, bra- the, the abrasions, and the brokenness seem far greater than when they were little kids. Because life is tough. But it's all part of the process of becoming. I share that with you because when I was 12 years old, or 11 years old, I met a man named Carl Dobson. Carl was very, very influential in me coming to Christ. Some of you have heard me talk about Carl because of the impact on my life. Carl didn't just help me come to know Christ, but he poured his life in me. When I went from a spiritual baby, he walked me through all the bumps, all the scrapes, all the, all the bruises, until where I became what I would say is a, a follower of Christ. I became a mature believer. And, and it's no doubt that it's because of Carl's life and his ministry that, that I'm in the ministry today. Well, this last week, my mentor, my spiritual father, went to be with the Lord. So it, it, it's, this has caused me to think about his process in helping me to become And as I was thinking about this message, what hit me was he didn't just help me become. He helped me to cross over to the other side. Do you know what it means spiritually to cross over to the other side? It's probably a terminology that you're not familiar with. But when someone crosses over from the other side, it's not just when they go from, from being someone who doesn't know Christ to coming to know Christ. Uh, that, that, that certainly is crossing over to salvation. But I'm talking about those of us who know Christ crossing over. See, to cross over in your spiritual life, it means that you move from no longer needing to be the one who served, but the one who now initiates serving. To cross over to the other side, it means that you're the one who no longer has to be fed all the time, but you're actually now helping to feed. It's moving from immaturity in your faith to maturity in the faith. It's crossing over that bridge in which you can't turn back that says, I'm going to be someone who takes responsibility for others to help them along in the faith. Now, if you're a parent in this room, you get this. Because you went through all your singleness, all the way, even maybe into your early marriage, and it really was all about you and your relationship. But then you had children. And all of a sudden, you were responsible for someone who could not take responsibility for themselves. And so you had to grow up. You had to become someone who could take care of someone else. That's, that's what it means to cross over. We're crossing over to the other side of our faith. We're crossing over from fear to faithfulness. And throughout the Bible, we see this take place. There's one story after another story after another story, whether it was Abraham who crossed over by crossing through animals that had been slain in order to reach a covenant relationship with God. There's David who went down and he crossed over in faith when he took these stones, put them in his pouch, and then he stood before Goliath and he said, no one's going to talk about my God in such a way. They're going to have to go through me. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Gideon. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter any biblical character you talked about. What happens is, is they cross over to a place of dependence upon God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to allow God to work in my life in a powerful way. Now, one of the biggest opportunities came under the leadership of Moses. Many of you probably know this. The the, the Israelites had had been in in Egyptian bondage for, for a number of years. And God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to lead my people back to the promised land. And so Moses goes, and after uh, several years, he finally is in position. He delivers these plagues to the, to the Egyptian pharaoh because he will not let the people go. And finally, they set off, and they find themselves at the Red Sea. And he says, okay, it's time for us to cross over. 
It's time for us to trust God. We see the Egyptian army coming at us. It's time for us to trust God. And of course, God parts the Red Sea and they walk over. And for those of you who are saying, you know, I don't know if that's such a great miracle. It was the Red Sea. Well, if, you, if that's what you think, Red Sea, Red Sea, Red Sea, God parted this, parted this amazing body of water and the Israelites walked through. Great miracle. Red Sea, then God drowned the greatest army in history in six inches of water. Choose your miracle. Doesn't matter. What matters is, is that they crossed over. They stepped out in faith and they crossed over. I want to pick up, a story, pick up the story here in Numbers 13. Because they've been wandering, God's leading them back to the land of their forefather Abraham. And in Numbers 13, verse 1, you see this. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan. Now watch this next phrase. Which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out of the, of the desert of, of, of Paran. All of them were the leaders of Israelites. So here's what's happened. The Israelites are wandering. They, they come to this encampment in, in, in the area pretty close to the Dead Sea and, and, and the Promised Land. And he says, okay, send out 12 spies. One person, one leader, one respected individual from every tribe. And you can see the list of names from 4 to 16 in case you're trying to find a name for your children. They go out and they, they go out into the land. They actually cross over. They go across into the promised land. And what they experience is unbelievable. You can read it here in this passage. They, they, they're literally blown away by the fruitfulness of the land. At the same time, you have these 12, these 12 spies, 10 of them, they see it, they, they grab some of it, they take it back, but they also see that the Philistines, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Nephilim, they're all in this area. Two of them, they see the same exact thing, but their response is different. So they come back and they give the report. And, and Joshua and Caleb, they're like going, it's time to go. Remember, God said, I am giving you this land. I'm giving it to you. If God has given it to us, why are we sitting here? But the other 10 go, oh, no, 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 no. Did you see those giant people? Did you see what we would have to come up against? There's no way we can go. And so they did a really dumb thing. They took a vote. Do you know what happens when you take a vote on God's will? It usually doesn't turn out too well. They took a boat, and instead of crossing over into the land of promise, they wandered another 40 years. That generation never got to see the promised land. That generation never got to taste the goods. They died off because they weren't willing to step out in faith. And that's what fear does to us. You, you, you come to this crossroad of faith and fear. And it's amazing what fear to, does to us. Fear, it, it inoculates us. Fear, it brings paralysis. Fear, it creates detours. Whereas faith engages. Faith believes that God will and God can. Faith steps out even into the unknown because it knows that God is faithful to his promises. And so they stepped out. And here, here's what you can't miss. For anyone to cross over to the other side in their faith, they have to be willing and ready to engage their fears. Because God is going to put you in places where you must depend on him and him alone. If you don't have to trust in God, then God's not in it. He's not. And so the Israel took a vote. They end up wandering for 40 years. Now, let's fast forward those 40 years. 40 years later, Moses, he's sitting on Mount Nebo, can't go in, passes away, and now the Israelites are under new leadership. You can put up a sign, new management. And Joshua has become the leader. The same Joshua that was one of the two spies who says, let's take the land, God has given it to us. And so they go across, and I want you to look at Joshua chapter 1. And I'm going to read very quickly the first nine or ten verses. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. To the Israelites. Now watch this. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river to the Euphrates, to all through the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea to the west. Look, watch this. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Now, if the creator of the universe gives you that promise, I think you ought to have a little confidence, don't you? He goes on. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and courageous. Be bold. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey. This is key. Be careful to obey all the law. Not some of it. Not the verses you like. Not the ideas you think are, are handy dandy in that, moment, in that moment. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right to the left. Or that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. So don't just know the word. Live it. Live it. Then. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So what do you think Joshua did? Think Joshua took another vote? So Joshua ordered the officers of, of the people, go through the camp, tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, we will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land your God has given you for your own. About 10 years ago, this church under what they believed at the time to be the leading of the Holy Spirit, said, we believe God wants us to do more. Now, I realize many of you weren't here then. I wasn't. And so we're taking a baton of faith, and we're running the next leg in the race. But in that decision, it was decided that we would not just renovate this, but we would go across the street and we would build a ministry to the community. And we have been eight years, nine years into phase one, the 1.0 version. And it was a version to introduce ourselves to the community, engage them, and as God gave opportunities, share and minister Christ. Well, I believe that God is saying it's now time for 2.0. It's time to step up. And I have charged Mark Matson, our pastor of mobilization and missions, and, and I've charged Lisa Steerwaltz, who we just elevated to made her full time, and she's now the bridge director, to go in a new direction with the bridge. And it's a direction which I believe is going to be the intent, not just of God's heart, but maybe even a greater intent to what was the heart of this church when we started it so many years ago. Now for all of you who served at the bridge, all of you who put so many hours ministering to the community, thank you so much. We could not be here today if it weren't for what you've done over the last eight years. So thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for faithfully serving. But I believe we've just been scratching the surface. And I think there are things that God wants to do that are far more intentional than we've ever been at the bridge. That is far more exhausted than we've ever been at the bridge. And talking with Mark and talking with several of the people on the bridge leadership team, what I'm hearing from them is, we're ready. We're ready to go. As I shared with you last week, it's one thing for us to say, you know, as a church, we want to build a bridge and to give money to that. But for the bridge to be what the bridge can be, it requires more than we, than, than we hope some people will go over and serve. It is a place that we all must engage. It's a place that we must see as the opportunity we have to launch into the Great Commission. And so what I've charged them to do is for it to become the actual sending agency of our, of our church into the Great Commission. 
into the Acts 1-8 model, into going to ministering to our community, ministering to our state, ministering to our nation, ministering to the world. So every single mission trip that happens from our church, whether it's going to, whether it's going to, to Spain or Calgary or Nicaragua or China or wherever it's going to go, it gets launched from the bridge. Everything that we do in the community where we're working with with, with the North American Mission Board planting churches, excuse me, in the country, everything we're doing with, with, with Indianapolis or, or, or Atlanta or wherever we're, we believe God's calling us to plant a church, it gets launched through the bridge. Everything that we partner with in the community, whether it's the, whether it's the uh, Pregnancy Resource Center, whether it's the Healing Bridge Clinic, whether it's Wellspring Living or Christian Families Today or uh, any of these other ministries that we're partnered with, it gets launched through the bridge. And then everything that we're doing to minister to the community here, whether it's a support group, whether it's an athletic group, whether it's a, a new a new tutoring class or, or a reading class, something that can meet a need in the community. It happens at the bridge. So when you drive onto our campus, we have a lot going over here. And we're certainly through our preschool, children's, everybody, we're going to do what we can to minister to people. But when it comes to being a member in this church, when it comes to saying, I'm more than an attender, I want to participate in this church, everyone Everyone, 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 everyone that was in the first service, we must be launched into the Great Commission through the bridge. That would have been a good place for an amen, even in a Baptist church. Why? Because God didn't call us to just come and get in a holy huddle and care about each other. He called us to be one in spirit, committed to taking his love into the world around us. And we can do that together. But to do that, we've got to cross over. I know some of you have already crossed over. Some of you, you're, you're serving and you're doing things through the bridge. But it's, there's many of us that we've never crossed over. We, we, we thought about it. We've gone to the edge of this asphalt river and, and we've looked across and we thought, man, I'd love to be over there. But I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared, what's going to be, I'm scared what's going to be required of me. I, I don't know that I have the time. I don't know that I have the skills or the gifts. Trust me, you do. Let me tell you one thing about Carl Dobson that blows me away. I've never met a person more ingenious when it comes to sharing the gospel. One day we're driving down the road and, and he sees an old baseball machine with a broken arm on it sitting in the trash. We stop. He goes up, knocks on the door and says, hey, what are you doing with that baseball machine? Is it trash? Yeah, it's trash. Can I have it? Sure. I help him load it into his truck. We take it back to his house. He fixes it within months, years. It's gone from a batting cage sitting in his backyard to be to an indoor batting cage that teams from all over Atlanta, because he would go to every high school and every middle school, and he would go to every public park and say, hey, I have a free batting cage in my backyard if you want to come use it. Hundreds, thousands of kids playing baseball and softball came to his house, and while they're sitting there hitting, he's sitting there talking to people about Jesus. I don't know how many students came to know Christ sitting outside of a batting cage that he built because he picked up something off the, inside the street. Or then this time he, he, he could fix anything. We were driving down the road and he found a, a go-kart sitting in the trash. What does he do? He picks it up, we put it in the car, we, we fix it, and then he makes two more and we, he takes them to the church parking lot, puts four cones down, spreads some sand in the corners and says, hey, want, anybody want to come ride go-karts? There's 20, 30, 40 kids playing, watching, playing, riding go-karts, three at a time. What does he do while everybody else is riding go-karts? He's standing there talking to people about Jesus. There's no telling. And I've already alluded to the fact that he, he, Carl was a cross between John the Baptist and, and the Apostle Paul. I don't know that a comb ever hit his head. 
He looked unkempt. His shirt tail was most of the time out. He was one of the most unassuming people you would ever meet. And yet he was bold. And he was courageous because he was convinced. You know what Carl did? I've heard over and over and over stories. Carl would do something so simple as get trays of Stouffer's lasagna. Go down to the dorms at Georgia Tech and start serving lasagna. To these kids, many of whom call themselves atheists or agnostics. And then he'll sit down and almost in a Ravi Zacharias type form begin answering and asking questions. And I've been reading on, on, on different sites on Facebook. He has led hundreds of Georgia Tech students to Christ because he knew how to serve a thing of lasagna. How many of you know how to serve food? Can you serve food in Jesus' name? The only thing exceptional about Carl was someone flipped the switch and his answer to Jesus was always yes. It was always yes. And what I believe that God is calling us, God is calling out our yes. Will we engage? Will we go? We have every resource we can ever ask or imagine more than we could ever ask or imagine. But what it takes is for every one of us to say, yes, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to engage. And so with that in mind, I, I want to share with you one thing and then I have a special treat for you today. What does the bridge look like? 18 to 24 months from now because it's going to take time it's going to take time for some of us to get the courage to go and engage it's going to take time to get us our church postured in this way but what does it look like the first thing is intentionality we have the garden club the kiwanis the we have esl from from a, a, a college we have homeschools that come there's basketball, there's pickleball, there's, in fact, I have a list of everything that's going on at the bridge right now. In sports and fitness, pickleball, basketball, volleyball, softball, Zumba, chair class, walking, body mechanics, stretching, and flex. In support ministries, we have ESL, sign language, Club 55, Parkinson support, domestic violence support, and lunch bunch. In the community, there's meeting space, cafe, game room, garden club, blood drives, kiwanas. In leisure activities, there's ballroom dancing, dulcimer, sewing, and quilting. And then there's Bible studies, student ministries, movie and a message for men that happen on a weekly basis pretty much. And you know what? It's awesome. But we can become more intentional. And so immediately I'm charging our bridge ministry to not just come in and say, hey, thank you so much for being here. But to go in and, and set aside three to five minutes. So five minutes after a group's supposed to start, someone from the bridge walks in and they're going to say something like this. We're so thankful that you're at the bridge. The bridge is a ministry center to the community from First Baptist Peachtree City, which is right across the street in case you didn't know that. And we want you to know that while we're here and we're, we're, you're welcome to use it, we're also here for you. And so if there's a prayer need, if you need to sit down and talk with someone about something that's going on in your life, it would be our privilege to be a part of that, to sit down and, and talk with you and encourage you. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love for you to come visit our church. Also, as you leave today, if this is your first time at the bridge, we have a gift for you. And that gift is going to be a coffee mug. It's going to be something that's going to have a gospel track. It's going to have information about our church. And it's going to have information about the bridge with an invitation to come and to check us out. I call it intentional relational not confrontational. We're not going to hold people up. People aren't going to come to the bridge and we're going to go, oh, let's frisk you in the name of Jesus. No, we're not going to do that. But what we are going to do is we're going to intentionally communicate God's love and the, good, and the good ministries of our church and invite people to participate. I think we can do that, don't you? It's easy. But then there's the things that we can do to minister to the community. And let me, let me say this. It's, while we have some functional jobs at the bridge that many of you have volunteered for. And we're so thankful for that because the bridge can't function unless 
somebody is working at the welcome desk and someone's working at the cafe and someone's helping with security. But there's a whole frontier of ministry that every one of us can participate in based upon our gifts, our talents, our abilities. And, and, and we want to see us move from just functional roles to very personally engaged roles of ministry. So for example, there are some of you in this room, you are phenomenal leaders. Not good leaders, phenomenal leaders. I, I, I'm looking around the room, I'm seeing several faces that I know, some of you, you travel the country teaching leadership. Why not teach leadership at the bridge to the community? There's some of you that, who here knows how to read? Anybody? Who here doesn't know how to read? Okay. Um, do you know how many children in our community don't know how to read? That we could start a reading club in the name of Jesus to build a bridge to share the love of Christ? Or there's tutoring? There's, I mean, if you like underwater basket weaving, we'll find you a pool somewhere, okay? But it's, it's using our gifts, our talents, and abilities. Here's just, here's some thoughts. You know, we are in the golf community of the world, and yet, why not have a golf ministry? Hello. We're in the triathlon capital of the southeast. Just had one yesterday. Why not have a triathlon, running, biking ministry? Hello. I mean, just easy, simple things. Here's some, here's some big things. Tutoring, first aid, car man. How many of you know how to change a tire on a car? How many, how many don't want to confess that you don't? Why not have a basic car maintenance class or a basic home maintenance class? And some of you, you guys could do that in your sleep. And yet... People will come, and you're going to earn the right to do it. Because we don't just have a home maintenance class. We have a home maintenance class for the cause of Christ. It's using our gifts, our talents, and skills. Here's some incredible opportunities. Grief share, special needs support group, divorce care, celebrate recovery, financial services. There's some of you, you're brilliant with finances. And there are people in our community that have such financial struggles that we can provide. Counseling service, uh, parenting support, job seekers, ad addiction support, respite care for people who are taking care of aging parents or people taking care of, of children with special needs. And this is just scratching the surface. I would love to see us offer Bible study fellowship for men and for women at the bridge. There's untold opportunities, but for that to happen, we've got to get out of our pews and use our gifts to make that happen. That's the reason God has called so many of us here and given us the talents and abilities. How, here's one. I just saw someone who, who's a, a gifted musician. Why not offer music classes at the bridge? Anybody, anybody like to do art? Art classes at the bridge. Folks, there are, are things that people want and need to engage in, and we have a $6 million building that we can release and unleash to meet that need in order to earn the right to talk about Jesus. Intentionality. Expansion of ideas. <sighs> so that brings me to my conclusion. Are we ready to cross over? Are we ready to go to the other side? Are we ready to embrace what God has obviously entrusted to us for his glory? So here's what I need you to do. I need everybody to get all your stuff. We're going on a road trip. And if I see you go out that door, go into your car, we're going to pray all your babies are born naked. <laughs> if there was ever one time that I want to ask you to indulge me as your pastor, it's now. Because there's a reason. So here's what we have. If any of you need assistance, because the journey, it might be too difficult for you. There are golf carts out. If you'll go out this door and go out in the breezeway, there's golf carts there. And they're more than happy to transport you. Everybody else, you can go out this door. You can go out this door. I want to ask you to meet me as quickly as possible on, our, on this side of the property right at the road. 
Got it? All right, get your stuff, let's go.